wonderful. We are expecting a pretty good group size group again today. Um, thank you again uh, for everyone who was attending. Uh, thanks for attending. Um, if you were at, just at the aeronautical engineering overview, thank you for spending you know, more hours with us uh, about learning about the RPI School of Engineering. Uh, again, my name is Greg Marcoux. I'm one of the assistant directors of admission in the admissions office. Um, we have Dr. Kurt Anderson, one of our associate deans in the School of Engineering here. He'll be presenting on uh, becoming an engineer at RPI. Uh, but to, again, a little bit of a service announcement. It is a moderated chat. So if you have a question, definitely submit it via the chat feature um, on your screen. We will see those questions first. I will do one question at a time just so it's a little less confusing. I will answer any admissions questions during the presentation in the chat. And then Dr. Anderson will answer lots of questions for you uh, in regards to um, what he's going to talk about in the School of Engineering. So at this point, I'll pass it off to Dr. Anderson for him to get started. Thank you, Greg. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Kurt Anderson. I am the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Studies here at Rensselaer, and I'm also a professor of aerospace and mechanical engineering. I've now been at Rensselaer 25 years. Before I came to Rensselaer, I was a professor at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Go Buckeyes! And uh, before that, I had worked for about a dozen years in industry, in the defense sector, on some rather large rockets and uh, large complex spacecraft, including the International Space Station. So today, I'd like to talk to you about becoming an engineer at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and specifically about those things that make a Rensselaer engineering degree and a Rensselaer education special. Um, the slides that I'm going to go through rather quickly, maybe too quickly, are just sort of to stir some thoughts, get you thinking, and uh, hopefully leave us a lot of time for questions and answers because what you know, the most important question that I have to answer is the one that you ask, not the one that I think you're interested in. So first off, congratulations uh, for getting accepted into Rensselaer's School of Engineering. We have a long, proud, and storied history. You're probably aware that we are the oldest engineering school in the English-speaking world. And uh, so we've been doing this a long time, and I like to think that we're very good at it. Also, with regard to engineering, I like to think, in fact, I definitely think, that engineers have the greatest job in the entire world. Why? Because an engineer takes someone's thought, an idea, a dream, and an engineer makes it reality. Not what somebody thinks it ought to look like or what it ought to do. No, an engineer actually makes it real. So it functions and it does exactly what it's supposed to do and it hopefully does it well. So I think that's just terrific. So if one looks at the world today and the world of 100 years ago or a world of 150 years ago, an argument can be made that in an average sense, things have gotten better for the average person. Maybe not better for some, better for others than some others. But in general, things haven't improved and an argument could be made that a lot of this improvement has been made possible through technology and engineering. So I actually find it pretty amazing that in the United States, a country with about 300 million people in it, only 5% of the people out there working are engineers. So if you look at who made those contributions, those significant contributions, a lot of them have been RPI graduates, RPI engineers, RPI scientists. You can go back to the first industrial revolution in Washington Roebling class of 1857 was the chief architect for the Brooklyn Bridge. You had Ted Hoff class of 58 who was co-inventor of the microprocessor. Steve Sasson, class of 72 and 73, the inventor of the digital camera. Curtis Prem, class of 82, the um, inventor of the graphical processing unit. Professor um, Ching Su, who's still here, developing the natural languages interface. 
And after that, well, I hope maybe it'll be one of you, the class of 2024. So what are some of the things that are notable about a Rensselaer engineering education? Well, our students are amongst the best and brightest from around the world. We graduate engineers who are ready to solve real problems. Our engineers are known for not needing their hand held and being able to hit the ground running. Consequently, our graduates are very highly sought after by industry. You know, we give our engineering students resources they need to explore, learn, grow, and develop confidence as engineers. Consequently, our graduates are leaders in technology, in research, and education, medicine, law, business, and their communities. Um, also, our faculty are generally research active, heavily research active. We're a research one institution. And as such, our faculty explicitly try to bring their research and their experience into the classroom and educate and integrate it in the classroom. Uh, Rensselaer has long been known for its innovation in engineering education. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And we also have many extracurricular activities but those extracurricular activities are actually used by a majority of our students. And just some of these are the more notable ones are our very well-developed undergraduate research program. I've had as many as, oh boy, I have 16 undergrads, I think currently doing work with me on my research. Um, our entrepreneurship programs, our international experience, our co-ops, and very much more. So let's talk a little bit about the engineering or the academic structure. We have seven academic departments, and associated with those, we have 11 accredited undergraduate engineering degrees. We have the engineering degrees that you've probably heard of and might expect, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, civil engineering, and so forth. However, we have a lot of other engineering programs that you may have never heard about. For instance, chemical and biological engineering, management engineering, industrial and systems engineering, environmental engineering, computer and systems engineering, material science engineering. So there is a lot of other engineering out there that you may not have even recognized or been aware of as engineering. Um, also, because we have so many different aspects of engineering, I wouldn't blame you if you were a little bit blown away and said, oh my God, I wasn't aware that there was something called biological engineering. What is that? How do I decide? You know, I, I have signed up for biomedical engineering. Maybe that's what I want, or maybe that's not what I, what I don't want. So you shouldn't be the least bit concerned or fearful of the fact that we've got all these engineering programs here, many of which you may not be familiar with. Indeed, you should embrace it. If you look at historically, the students that apply to RPI and come to RPI, historically 20 to 25% of them come in as undeclared. It varies from year to year. Sometimes it's as low as 8%, sometimes as many as 25%. But these are students that knew they wanted to be an engineer, but they weren't sure exactly what engineering field they wanted. If you look at the students that come in as undeclared, and then additionally at those students that thought they say wanted to be a civil engineer, but then later changed to mechanical engineering or some other discipline during their first year, year and a half, those students that were undecided or students that came in and switched this number leaps to 40 to 45 percent so it's not a majority but it's certainly a super minority so we understand that so our courses our program is very much set up with the intent that you would spend your first year year and a half maybe even two years exploring learning about the different engineering disciplines and then deciding what you are really interested in and finding your passion because our desire is that everybody that gets accepted to the School of Engineering will graduate in the major of their choice. 
So if you're going to spend four years getting an engineering degree, it might as well be one that you really are interested and you want to do. So now that you've started, your homework assignment is, is to look into the different engineering fields and you check out the web pages and you read the templates. You might get an idea that these engineering degrees are highly focused and in some degree they are, but you might get a very incorrect impression and that is that engineering is sort of like silos out in a farmer's field you know each engineering degree has its own silo and inside that silo everything pretty much looks the same but it's a very different crop than what was harvested and is in the silo next door well that actually couldn't be further from the truth this perception is somewhat historical and to some degree it's somewhat imposed by the accreditation agency abet which used to stand for Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology, because the major topics that are required for an accredited degree in each one of these disciplines is defined by ABET as selected or recommended by the professional society associated with that discipline. So if you look at the requirements for an accredited degree in mechanical engineering at RPI, well, those are the same requirements as you're going to find at MIT, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, and so forth. However, what you will discover is that the way the school chooses to describe or represent or teach those topics may be very, very different. And in that regard, I think Rensselaer truly shines. They aren't farmer silos at all. In fact, if you come to Rensselaer, you'll discover very, very quickly that when you're sitting in on a course that may be a civil engineering course and you're learning something in the context of a civil engineer, I would challenge you, raise your hand, ask the professor, pardon me, professor, can you give an example of how this method has, can be used on a problem that has nothing to do with civil engineering? You'll be blown away. The professor will have an answer for you immediately. Why? Because most of the challenging problems are actually happening on the boundaries between disciplines. Also, there's few significant real world engineering problems that are monolithic in a single discipline. So anybody that's working on a real world problem, a challenging real world problem, is already working with engineers and scientists from many different disciplines. And very likely the research your professor is doing is on that boundary between disciplines. And if I could use myself as an example, I'm technically an aero. I teach courses in space vehicle design and orbital mechanics. I do research in aerospace, yes, but the majority of my research for maybe the last 15 years has been in molecular dynamics, RNAs, DNAs, enzymes, proteins, and even stem cells. Why? What does any of that have to do with aerospace engineering? Well, it just happens that methods I developed and was using for the modeling and design of large, complex spacecraft, like the space station, actually work really, really well in modeling complex molecules such as RNAs and DNAs. And so I, I'm still working in that area. This is not the exception. I think this is closer representation to the rule. So what does it take to be a successful and happy engineer, at least at Rensselaer? Well, hopefully you get satisfaction out of solving challenging problems because that is what engineers get paid to do. You, an engineer's job is to solve other people's problems. Ideally, you're creative. Why? Because if it was easy, somebody's already found the answer. The challenging problems need creative solutions. So the best engineers I know actually have a creative bent, and I would even say an artistic bent. They play a musical instrument, they paint, they sculpt, they do ballroom dancing, whatever. But you'll discover that many engineers have a very creative side and it will certainly help you here at Rensselaer. Um, hopefully you like working with people. Why? Again, real problems are multidisciplinary and they're gonna require teamwork. 
So here at Rensselaer, you'll discover that you're going to be doing design problems in a team setting, and the team setting will be multidisciplinary. This is something that sets us apart from other schools, and I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Boy, you need to be adaptable. Why? Because probably what you tried the first time didn't work or didn't work as well as you thought it would, and so you need to learn from the experience and adapt. You need to be a critical thinker. You need to be able to look at what other people have done and see the strengths and weaknesses and what can make it better. You need to look at what you have done in your team and what the strengths and weaknesses are of that and how you can make it better. You need to think abstractly. Why, as I said before, an engineer's job is to take someone's idea, someone's thought, someone's dream and make it reality. So you're taking something that's no more than a concept and you have to look at it, you have to look at the world around you, and you have to see how you can take different things from different fields and hook them together and produce a system that will achieve that person's dream. Oh yeah, last item, mathematically inclined. It would really help if you are strong mathematically, or at least you've got a bent towards it. Why? Because an engineer's job is to make things work in the real world, and the real world is governed by the law of physics. So the rule book or the law book is physics, and the language is mathematics. So it would really help if you were strong mathematically. Oh yeah, and by the way, if you think you want to be an engineer because you hate to write, sorry, no. You got to be able to write. If I can uh, plagiarize Chris Letchford, who's the chair of our Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, Chris told me years ago that all engineers are mad. And what he means by that is we model, we do analysis, we design, and we document and you only get paid for that last D. If your work hasn't been documented, it effectively doesn't exist for all the people that are out there that might benefit from it. So at Rensselaer, as an engineering student, you are going to write. You are going to write a lot. You're gonna be writing reports. You're gonna be writing proposals. You are gonna be um, doing all sorts of things and indeed, we have multiple writing intensive courses. When you graduate from Rensselaer, you'll need at least two, one in discipline, one in HASS. We actually have multiple required courses in engineering, which would satisfy the writing intensive requirement. And we've explicitly chosen not to get them formally listed as writing intensive requirements, because then in theory, one could would not have to take some of the other writing intensive requirements. Yes, writing is that important. So what does the curricula look like? Well, another thing that sets Rensselaer apart is at many schools, many good programs, you really don't start taking a hardcore engineering course until you're probably in your sophomore year. At Rensselaer, we understand that for many people that's too late. You've probably never done any engineering. You're not sure what engineering is like. We would like to introduce you to a real hardcore modeling and analysis engineering course up front and early so you know what you're getting yourself into. So all of our engineering curricula, all of our programs, first term freshman year, you take introduction to engineering analysis. It is a serious modeling and analysis course, and it's a prerequisite for most of your other engineering courses. And we expose you to that on day one. So if you enjoy the course, great, congratulations. Welcome to RPI. I'm sure you'll be very happy here. If you hate the course, take it as a warning. We stuck that course for first term freshman year so you can see what you're getting yourself into early. and You don't have to wait till you're sophomore year to see what engineering is going to be like. Second term sophomore year, we have a engineering elective. Um, 
it tends to be related to whatever course or major you think you want to go into. It, however, is a course that has been selected to be very, very good with multiple degrees. So if you decide to change disciplines, this second course in engineering that you'd be taking the second half of your freshman year will would always be a good choice. But it is a course that we have second year or second term freshman year to start introducing you to the discipline that you think you want to go into. Second year, more math, more physics, but then multiple core engineering courses. And again, at least one other course that starts educating you in the discipline that you've chosen that you want to get into. So in the case of electrical engineering, you'd be taking introduction to circuits and introduction to electronics. In aerospace engineering, you'd be taking fundamentals of flight and some of the earlier courses there. Third year, you're well into your major. Fourth year, you're well into your major. You're doing your serious design courses. And throughout this, you'd be taking your humanities, arts, and social science courses. Um, basically, you can expect 28 to 32 credits of math, about 22 credits of humanities, arts, and social sciences, about 15 credits of engineering core courses. These are cross-cutting courses that are central to most engineering disciplines so they don't reside within any single engineering discipline. Think statics, think strength of materials, think dynamics, think electronics and instrumentation, modeling and analysis of uncertainty, engineering economics, these are all fit under this umbrella. Then we have our multidisciplinary core courses. These are courses associated with your chosen discipline but still or incorpus, incorporate multiple disciplines because it's understood that each engineering major does work with multiple other disciplines. Mechanicals deal with biomeds, deal with arrows, deal with civils, deal with electricals, as an example. Then we've got our disciplinary electives and our discipline core courses, and then finally your free electives. So another thing that makes RPI stand out is design is pervasive throughout our curricula. All engineering problems at some level are design problems. Something broke and you want to figure out how to make it better, or something didn't exist and you want to figure out how to make it in the first place. So most engineering problems are intrinsically design problems. Consequently, we start introducing you design in the very first year in the CAD courses. The second year, um, you have an introduction to engineering design or an inventor's studio class. This is a multidisciplinary team design. If you take these courses, you'll find yourself nominally in a team of four other students where each member of other members of that team are from a major or engineering discipline that's different from you. Why? Because that's what you're gonna deal with probably when you get out in the real world. And then you as a team need to come up with a project that is of interest to you. And your first job is to convince your instructors, because the course is team taught, that this project is intrinsically valuable and is worth your team putting time into and developing a product. And then you spend the rest of the term designing, building, and demonstrating a fully functional prototype of this system that you were thinking about. Really an amazing class. Um, these are just some examples of it. Similarly, then you go on to the capstone design course. Capstone design, what is that? Every accredited engineering program in the entire country must have a culminating design experience called a capstone design. At most schools, an argument could be made that what they are doing for their culminating design experience is very much like what was developed either here at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute or at Stanford University now over 40 years ago. We couldn't be happier that the rest of the country is doing for their capstone design course, what we were doing at Rensselaer 40 years ago.
And I know this is the case because I am actually an accreditation evaluator. And every year I visit top engineering programs around the country to check them for accreditation. And indeed, they are doing what we did at Rensselaer at least 26 years ago because I was here then and I know. Okay. We have since moved on. In our capstone design courses, you're given a project and that project isn't an academic exercise. The majority of our projects come from industry. Because they are significant real world projects, your team isn't made up of six or seven mechanical engineers or six or seven civil engineers or six or seven biomedical engineers. It is made up of a team of electrical, mechanical, material scientists, industrial, aero, if that's appropriate, biomed, if that's appropriate, environmental, if that's appropriate. Teams are constructed that make sense to solve this real world problem. And then you spend the term working as a multidisciplinary team on that real world problem where the consulting engineer on the job is probably a program manager from industry who brought this project to RPI. Again, a really, really, really great model. So these are some of the examples of some of the things that came out of the multidisciplinary design lab. I kind of like this one, optimizing the sled design for the um, Olympic skeleton team. That was one that I was one of the consulting engineers on. Um, but there are many, 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 many others. And again, these come to us from industry. We also have a lot of maker, thinker spaces on campus. I kind of like to call them maker breaker spaces. The forge is kind of fun because that is um, a maker space that was designed and run by the students, though it's funded by the School of Engineering. We also have the Douglas Mercer Laboratory, which is focused on electrical work, and that's strictly open to students that can go in there and build anything they want, nothing to do with classes, or they can do class-related work in there if they want, and many, 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 many others. We also have a wide variety of activities outside of the classroom, co-ops, research, um, student competitions. Here's an example of some more student competitions, undergraduate research, I've already mentioned that. Engineers for a Sustainable World. And again, I would highly recommend our undergraduate research project. It's extremely well developed and um, that you spend your first year or so discovering what you really are interested in and then seek out faculty working that area and start doing research with them. And that is where you really get to see where the future is because most of us, our research is not something that's targeting a problem that is going to have a solution in two to three years. The solution you will see manifest in five, 10, 15 years. So you'll get to see where the future is and where the future is going. And just some examples of that is we have quite an entrepreneurial spirit here at Rensselaer. A number of our students have gone on to produce and start very innovative companies. I highly recommend you check some of these companies out. One of them is Ecovative Design. Uh, styrofoam and plastic, you know, even though it was thought to be wonderful material, it is really pretty miserable stuff from an environmental point of view. Think about styrofoam. You know, you have styrofoam packing, but the, once it gets into the environment, it doesn't really break down. It just breaks into smaller and smaller pieces, which is then in, ingested by sea life, poisons things. It's really pretty vile stuff. So this company started by two RPI engineers um, went out and figured out how they could make a product that has the same structural properties and behavior as styrofoam but it's actually produced by mycelia, which is a form of mold or is associated with most molds, mushrooms, funguses, and um, feed it industrial waste, think uh, wheat chaff with some enzymes to help break it down. It produces a substance which is very much like styrofoam. They then kill the fungus produces this packing material or this insulating material, think of home insulation, 
But now you just go out and throw it in a compost heap and it breaks down completely. No detrimental byproducts. Or um, Vital Vio. This is a firm that came out of our lighting center where they use certain spectra of light emitting diodes to kill uh, microbes more focused on bacterium in various settings, including hospitals, airplanes, and kitchens. Um, another firm was started by Mickey Amate students on using synthetic microjets to keep the boundary layer attached to large trucks and other vehicles or even aircraft to make them more aerodynamic. And this one is the one I probably like the best. The last one is HeartFlow. This was started by another RPI engineer who actually went on to become a uh, professor of biomedical engineering at Stanford. And the firm is called HeartFlow and they produce 3D patient specific models of the arteries and the blood vessels in and around the heart. So then they can assess blockages and then explore virtually different measures for dealing with that blockage. And this is in a patient specific model manner. So then they can determine what the best method is for dealing with that blockage for the patient. Maybe it's a stent, maybe it's drug therapy, maybe it's a bypass, but all this can be explored virtually using a patient specific model before they then go into the operating room or use the evasive method. So finally, last slide, then we'll open it up for questions and answers, and I hope you got a bunch of them, is that Rensselaer education is something very special. It's an engineering education with a world view, and I produced this graphic that sort of conveys it. Um, I like to say that we produce T-shaped engineers. And what is a T-shaped engineer? The engineer, when they come to Rensselaer, the engineering student spends their first year, year and a half, discovering their passion, what really excites them. Once they've discovered that passion, they build the stem of the T. They become very deep in the discipline and the methods and the science behind that discipline. But the crossbar of the T is they can see how they're connected to all the other disciplines, not necessarily engineering disciplines. Again, think of your thinking abstractly. They can see how they are connected to these other disciplines. So they may not know how to determine an answer to a challenging problem themselves, but they can see the way to get there and they see and know who to talk to. And so with that, I'd like to thank you very much for listening to me. And I would love to answer the questions you've got. And so I'm looking here.